In today's video, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the math no calculator section from the March 2019 SAT. I've scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT math sections, and as I go through these questions, I'm going to show you the most efficient way to solve each and every one. So with all that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's go ahead and get started with question number one. Question one says, Tony spends $80 per month on public transportation. A 10-ride pass costs $12.50, and a single-ride pass costs $1.50. If G represents the number of 10 ride passes Tony buys in a month and T represents the number of single ride passes Tony buys in a month, which of the following equations best represents the relationship between G and T? Well, we know that G is the 10 ride passes, which cost $12.50. So we need to have 12.50 times G plus $1.50 times the number of single ride passes T to get our total cost of $80, which we see is going to be an answer choice D. D has our correct answer there. All right, moving on to number two. In the equation above, T represents Brittany's total take-home pay in dollars for her first week of work, where H represents the number of hours she worked that week, and $1,000 represents a sign-on bonus. If Brittany's total take-home pay was $1,576, for how many hours was Brittany paid for her first week of work? So in this case, we need to solve for H. Now, we know T is going to be 1,576, and we know that that's going to equal 1,000 plus 18H. From here, all we gotta do is go through and solve for H. So first thing we're gonna do is subtract 1,000 from each side. Now when we do that, we're gonna be left with 576 is equal to 18H. After that, we can divide each side by 18. Now keep in mind here, do we actually have to go through and do that division problem? Not really. We can just see that 16 is going to be too low. 55 would be too high. D would also be too high. Our answer would have to be B just based on an estimate. Now if you wanted to do that full division, I can go ahead and do that for you as well. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got 18 going into 576, so 576. How many times does 18 go into 57? Well, that's going to be 3, and that would get us at um, 54. Okay, so we'd have a 3 up top. We'd have 54 on the bottom. Okay, that's going to leave us with a remainder of 3 because 57 minus 54 will leave us with 3. And then we drop our 6 down because 18 doesn't go into 3. 18 goes into 36 two times, and we see our answer is going to be 32. But keep in mind, estimating there is going to save you some time. So if you're able to just kind of look at it and see 16 is too low, 55 and 88 are too high, see it's going to be 32. It'll save you time rather than having to do that division. All right, moving on to number three now. A clothing store is having a sale on shirts and pants. During the sale, the cost of each shirt is $15, and the cost of each pair of pants is $25. Geoff can spend at most $120 at the store. If he buys S shirts and P pairs of pants, which the following must be true, well, he can't spend more than $120. The total cost has to be less than or equal to $120. So I can get rid of B and I can get rid of D. Next thing, I need to understand that P is my pairs of pants and each of those costs $25. So I need to have 25P. I see that my answer C has 25S, which is incorrect because it only has 15P. I need 25P, 15S being less than or equal to 120. So my answer there is going to be A. Number four, what is the solution to negative 3 times the quantity x minus 5 equals negative 2x plus 4? So what we got to do here is we got to distribute our negative 3 first. So let's go ahead and do that. We have to distribute it to our x and to our negative 5. That's going to give us negative 3x plus 15. That's going to be set equal to negative 2x plus 4. Now I want to get all my x's on one side, but I also want to keep my coefficient in front of x positive. So I'm going to add 3x to each side, leaving me with only x. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 4 from each side. 15 minus 4 will give me 11. Therefore, 11 equals x, and my answer number 4 is going to be a. So a is the answer for number 4. All right, moving on to number 5 now. For the function f defined above, what is the value of f of negative 1? f of any number just means we're plugging in that number. So we can go ahead and plug in negative 1. So we'll have negative 1 cubed. Negative 1 cubed is going to end up giving us negative 1. Okay, so I'm just going to put equals negative 1 down here. Then we'll have plus 3, so plus 3 times negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared is going to give us 1. 3 times 1 will give us a plus 3. Then we'll have minus 6 times negative 1. Well, negative 6 times negative 1 will give us a plus 6. And then we'll have minus 1. All right, from here we can go ahead and simplify down. So we're going to have negative 1 plus 3. That's going to end up giving us 2. And then we'll have a 6 minus 1. That's going to end up giving us a plus 5. So 2 plus 5 will give us 7. So our answer there is going to be C for number 5. Moving on to number six, we've got triangle ABC and triangle DEF are similar triangles where uh, segment AB and segment DE are corresponding sides. If segment DE is equal to two times segment AB and the perimeter of triangle ABC is 20, what's the perimeter of triangle DEF? Well, since we know each side of DE is double each side of triangle uh, ABC, we know that triangle DEF, its perimeter also has to be then twice the perimeter of ABC. So we do 2 times the perimeter of ABC, which is 2 times 20. We get our perimeter of DEF to be 40. So our answer there is going to be B for number 6, because each side length is double in that larger triangle what it is in the smaller triangle. All right, question 7, I believe, is what we are on now, and it is. So we've got, there were no jackrabbits in Australia before 1788. 
when 24 jackrabbits were introduced. By 1920, the population of jackrabbits had reached 10 billion. If the population had grown exponentially, this would correspond to a 16.2% increase on average in the population each year. Which of the following functions best models the population P of T of jackrabbits T years after 1788? All right, key thing we need to recognize is our initial number of jackrabbits is 24. So that's what needs to go before our parentheses. We see that we have that in options uh, B and also, also option C. We see in A, we have the wrong initial number of jackrabbits. So A is incorrect. Keep in mind, this is exponential growth. And then in option D, we also don't have anything in front of those parentheses. So D is incorrect as well. Next thing, we need to have our growth factor be what is in parentheses. Our growth factor is that 16.2% increase on average each year. Now, we have to include a 1 in front of that to account for our initial population. So our growth factor is going to be 1.162 in that parentheses. Okay, we see the only answer choice that has that is C, so C will be our correct answer. And then C is also raised to the correct exponent of T, T being years after 1788. So our answer there is going to be C because it has the correct exponential growth equation. Moving on to number 8 now. Which of the following is equivalent to the sum of 3x to the 4th plus 2x cubed and 4x to the 4th plus 7x cubed? We're just going to go ahead and have to combine terms here, right? We're just adding them together by getting that sum, right? So we're going to have 3x to the 4th plus 4x to the 4th. That's going to leave us with 7x to the 4th, okay? We find which answer choice has that. We see that that's going to be answer choice D. No other answer choice has 7x to the 4th, so our answer has to be D for number 8. We're on to number 9. And keep in mind when I drew these lines together, that just meant I was adding them together, not multiplying. All right, number nine, the function f is defined by f of x equals x squared, and the function g is defined by g of x equals x squared plus three. Which of the following translations of the graph of f and the xy plane results in the graph of g? Well, we see that they both have this x squared. Only difference is that the graph of g of x is moved three units upward. Okay, so a translation of three units upward is our correct answer for number nine, and that was answer choice B. Moving on to number 10 now. All right, so we've got a triangle, right? We've got two triangles, actually, and they're going to be similar triangles. And the figure above segments AE and BD are parallel if angle BDC measures 58. So we can go ahead and mark that down. BDC is 58. So we got 58 there. And angle ACE measures 62. So we'll go ahead and mark that down as 62. What is the measure of angle CAE? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mark that angle that we need to solve for in orange. Now keep in mind, angle CAE is the same as angle CBD. Okay, so we can go ahead and mark those two as the same. From there, we see we can do 180 minus... 62 and minus 58 to get the angle that we need of CAE. Okay, this is because these are similar triangles, right? And we also know that there's 180 degrees total in a triangle. From there, we know that that's just going to be 180 minus 120, which will leave us with 60 as the value of CAE, which means our answer is going to be B for question number 10. All right, moving on to question number 11 now. Question number 11 says an oceanographer uses some equation. Immediately when I see an equation like this, I'm going to take a quick glance at my answer choices. I see I've got P equals, so I'm just going to end up rearranging. I'll verify with my last sentence. It says which of the following represents the period of the wave in terms of the speed of the wave. Well, from here, all i got to do is multiply each side. Okay, Keep in mind my original equation is S equals 3 over 2P. I just multiply each side by the reciprocal of 3 over 2. So I'm going to multiply by 2 over 3 to each side. That's going to end up canceling these out, and I'm going to have 2 over 3s equals p. So 2 over 3s equals p. I see that's answer choice A. So A is my correct answer there. All right, number 12, which of the following could be an equation of the graph shown in the xy plane above? Well, I see that I'm going up by 1 as my increment on my y-axis, giving me a y-intercept of 4. So I need to have a plus 4 in my linear equation. I see I can get rid of A, and I can get rid of D then. Next thing I need to watch out for is what I'm incrementing by on my x-axis. I see I'm going up by 2, so I got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So what I can see now is as I go down by 4, I'm going to mark this in orange. As I go down by 4, so down 4, I'm going over to the right by 12. Okay, so I'm going down 4 to the right by 12. I see my slope there is going to be negative 1 third. Okay, so my answer here is going to be C. All right, moving on to number, uh, looks like number 13 now. So we've got triangle FGH is inscribed in the circle above. If arc FG is congruent to arc GH and the measure of angle G is 30, what is the measure of angle H? All right, key thing we need to recognize, arc FG, I'm going to mark that in orange, that's congruent to arc GH, which I'm going to mark in green. Okay, congruent means that they are equal, right? They're the same length. Now, because they're the same length, this angle F and this angle G, or I'm sorry, angle F and angle H have to be the same. So I'm actually going to mark those in blue. Okay, they each have to be the same. Now, we know that angle G is 30. Okay, we also know that all the angles in a triangle add up to 180. So what we can do here is we can do 180 minus 30, divide that by 2, and that's going to give us our angle H, angle H. 
Okay, 180 minus 30 is 150. 150 divided by 2 is 75. So 75 degrees is equal to angle H, and it's also equal to angle F as well. But in this case, we just have to recognize equal to angle H. So our answer is C for number 13. All right, number 14, which of the following is equivalent to? And then we've got the fourth root of x squared plus 8x plus 16. What we want to recognize here, x squared plus 8x plus 16, that could be rewritten as x plus 4 squared. Now, keep in mind, we have to account for that fourth root in front of that term. In order to do that, we could rewrite this as we have it squared, but it's to the fourth, or it's the fourth root of it, right? So it's x plus 4 squared, but we have to take the fourth root of that. So now we have x plus 4 to the power of 2 over 4. Well, we can rewrite that then as x plus 4 to the power of 1 half, because 2 over 4 is the same as 1 half, and we see we have answer choice D as our correct answer for number 14. All right, let's go ahead and do question 15. In the equation above, A and B are constants, and 0 is less than A, which is less than B. Which of the following could represent the graph of the equation in the xy plane? So first thing we want to do is just get this in slope-intercept form, because it's going to be a lot easier for you to see that way. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and subtract AX from each side. And then we're also going to go ahead and have to divide each side by B then. So we'll go ahead and divide each side by B. Now we've isolated Y. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this out so you can see it easier. So we're going to have Y then is equal to A, or negative A, X over B. Okay, so you could also just view this as negative A over B times X as your slope. Now you're also going to have plus B over B. Okay, B over B is just going to equal 1, so it would be plus 1. Now you have to solve for your slope here because answer choice A, C, and D all have that Y intercept of 1. Now, what you need to recognize, A and B both have to be greater than zero, so they both have to be positive. Keep in mind there's still that negative sign in front of them. Therefore, you're going to have to have negative slope. Okay, so slope is negative. We're going to write that down. Slope is negative. The other thing you have to realize is that B has to be greater than A. Okay, since B's got to be greater than A, your slope has to be negative, but your slope is also greater than negative 1. Now, when I say greater than negative 1, I mean that it's between, um, you know, negative like zero, negative 0 0.0001, as in it has to be negative, but it can't be a slope that is negative two. It has to be between zero and negative one, but it can't be zero. So now if we take a look at answer choice A, we see that's got a slope of negative one. That can't be true, okay? We know that our slope has to be greater than negative one. Answer choice B, we ha has the wrong y-intercept, B's wrong. Answer choice C, we see that our slope is negative one half. Okay, we also have the correct y-intercept there. So C is going to be our correct answer. If we took a look at D, we see there our slope is going to be, it looks like negative uh, two. Okay, now if our slope is negative two, that's going to be incorrect because we know our slope has to be between zero and negative one, but it can't be zero. Okay, so answer there is going to be C for number 15. All right, moving on to number 16 now. What value of x satisfies the given equation? Well, we've got x plus x equals 9. x plus x is the same as 2x. So if we're going to have 2x equals 9, we divide each side by 2 then. And then we're going to end up having x equals 9 over 2. So our answer there would be 9 over 2. All right, moving on to number 16. What is the solution to the equation above? Well, immediately what sticks out to me is that 11x minus 33, I could rewrite that as 11 times x minus 3. Now, when I do that, I can go ahead and cancel out my x minus 3s cancel out my x minus 3s, and I see 11 equals x. So the solution to the equation above will be 11. Moving on to number 18. All right, so 18, I've got a trick for you here. If x, y is the solution to the system of equations above, what's the value of 100x plus 40y? If you've watched my previous videos, you know anytime you see stacked equations, you're going to look to add or subtract to get what you need. In this case, it's not one single variable. In this case, it's x and y, right? It's 100x plus 40y. Now you're probably thinking, okay, clearly I can't get to there immediately. And you're right, you can't get there immediately. But what you can get is that same ratio, right, of that x to y. And I'll go ahead and show you. If we were to add these two equations together, we'd get 5x, and then we'd have 3y minus y, which give us plus 2y. We got 5x plus 2y is going to equal 61. Well, what's that ratio of x to y? We've got 5x per 2y. We've got that same ratio in 100x plus 40y. All we got to do is multiply our 5x plus 2y equals 61. If we multiply all of that, all of that by 20, that's going to give us that 100x. It's going to give us that plus 40y, and then that's going to give us what it's equal to. Okay, so we do that out. We're going to get 100x plus 40y is equal to 61 times 20. 61 times 20 is going to give us 1,220 as our answer. All right, moving on to number 19 now. We've got if t is greater than 0, which means t is positive, and then we've got and the quantity 3t squared minus 5 times quantity 3t minus 14 equals 0. What's the value of t? All right, well, we know t's got to be positive, but let's go ahead and go through this. So 3t in parentheses squared is going to be the same as 9t squared. 
Next, we got minus 5 times 3t. That's going to give us minus 15t. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this underline just because it's going to confuse you. So we got 9t squared minus 15t minus 14 is equal to 0. What's the value of t? From here, I'm going to go ahead and put 3t in my first parentheses and 3t in my second parentheses to get me to that 9t squared. All right, from here, I'm looking for factors of negative 14 that are going to get me to this negative 15, keeping in mind that I've got these 3t out front. Okay, so what this is going to look like is factors of 14. I could think 14 and 1, but if I was to put a 14 in on one and a 1 on the other, there's no way I'm going to end up getting to that negative 15. So I've got to think of my next factors, which are 7 and 2. If I think 7 and 2, I've got negative 15, which means I have to have that minus 7, but I'll have to have that plus 2 in order to get me to that negative 14. Now I just check if this works. 3t times negative 7 will give me negative 21t, and then I'll have plus 2 times 3t. That's going to give me plus 6t. I see that that's going to give me that positive, or I'm sorry, negative 15t. So from there, I see I've got my factors right. So now what I'm going to do is I see t's got to be positive. Therefore, this is going to be the factor I'm going to use because I'll have 3t minus 7 equals 0. I add 7 to each side. I'm going to get 3t equals 7. Divide each side by 3. Isolate t. I see t is equal to 7 over 3. What's the value of t? The value of t's got to be 7 over 3. All right, moving on to number 20. We've got h of x equals x cubed uh, plus a times x squared plus bx uh, plus c. The function h is defined above where a, b, and c are integer constants. If the zeros of the function are negative 5, 6, and 7, what is the value of c? All right, well, the zeros being negative 5 means that we've got an x plus 5, okay, because we've got to flip the sign, times an x minus 6, and then times an x minus 7. From here, all we got to do is just multiply our last term. All we need is the value of c. So we're going to have 5 times negative 6. That's going to end up giving us a negative 30. And then a negative 30 times a negative 7. Negative 30 times negative 7. That's going to end up giving us a positive 210. So our answer there is going to be 210. Hopefully this video was helpful. If it was, make sure to like and subscribe. In addition to that, if you're gaining value from my content, please consider donating. It helps me to be able to continue to put out these videos for free to as many people as I can. In addition to that, if you're looking for private SAT tutoring, college essay editing, or college admission consulting, be sure to check out my links in the description.